for more on the war situation, a visiting professor from the University of Massachusetts at Boston at the George Mitchell Peace Institute at Queen's University, Belfast. Uh, Darren Q joins me now. Good to have you join us. Thanks for having me back. So Ukraine seems to be losing ground um, on, the, on the battlefield. It also just experienced one of its worst defeats in the city of Avdivka. What's your assessment um, of, of the war in the last two years? And has Ukraine's counteroffensive measures since the last year produced any tangible result? Yeah, I think we have to sort of uh, distinguish between the tactical picture and the strategic picture here. And, and the tactical picture, yes, it certainly seems like uh, Russia is on uh, the offensive at the moment and seems to be making some gains in four or five different locations across the, the front lines. Um, but from a strategic perspective, uh, over the last two years, I think clearly if you look at Russia's strategic goals, uh, very few of those have been met, whereas on Ukraine's side, um, the, the ledger is certainly looking good, um, uh, you know, in, particularly in terms of simply the, the fact that Ukraine still um, survives. It, it is standing. It has managed to roll back the initial offensive of the Russians. Um, the Russians uh, were clearly uh, incensed by the possibilities of Ukraine joining NATO. That was not a possibility uh, in the past, but now because of this war, um, as you mentioned earlier, uh, uh, Ukraine is up for uh, European Union membership, and there is a possibility now of Ukraine joining NATO, although I think the, the West still knows how inflammatory that would be. Uh, but it's not within the, the, it's not outside the realm of the possible that, that Ukraine could be offered NATO membership the longer that this rolls forward. Um, so, uh, you know, I think looking at over the bigger picture, certainly uh, Ukraine is looking good. The big question will be how how much sort of progress can the current Russian offensive make? Uh, it doesn't seem likely that it's going to get too far. Uh, there could be a breakthrough, uh, but the Ukrainians are certainly very much ready for this. And I think a continuation of the stalemate is uh, a far more likely outcome. Which gets us into the longer term picture, and uh, a lot of this will then revolve around the American elections as well. Mm. And let's talk about the, the financing of this war. Um, according to Kiel Institute, Ukraine has received over $100 billion in, in support um, for, for its defense against Russia. Um, but the UK economy is now in recession. Um, money needed from the United States is stock. How long can Europe and the US practically sustain such draining financial support for Ukraine? I think a lot will depend upon the, the, the battlefield situation, but I do think that the Europeans and the West uh, can continue and will continue some sort, some level of support for Ukraine. Uh, there's no doubt um, that European capitals are increasingly uh, anxious uh, about the situation with Russia. Uh, we just heard the American administration uh, worrying about the possibility of Russians uh, putting uh, nuclear weapons into space. Um, there is no lack of motivation in the West to do something about this. I think the holdup of funds for Ukraine is a temporary picture right now in the United States based on American politics, uh, particularly around the personality of Donald Trump, uh, who we know uh, is very comfortable with Vladimir Putin and has expressed his admiration for Putin in the past. And this is clearly something the Russians are gambling on. If they can, if they can continue to eat away at the Ukrainian uh, resolve and if Trump can win the election, uh, in November, uh, the Russians are going to be counting on uh, American support uh, uh, falling further down the way. So honestly, I think that a Trump presidency would still have to provide some sort of measure of support for the Ukraine. And I do think we're going to see the, the Europeans stepping up to provide additional aid in the months to come. I think the Europeans are looking with increasing anxiety at the possibility of Trump uh, presidency again as well. And I think they're going to be moving more quickly now to try to get assistance, especially from the Germans, uh, the French, and I do think the British as well. Thank you so much for your time. As always, um, Professor Darren Q. Thank you for having me. Some politics now. U.S. Republican presidential hopeful Nikki Haley says the new Quinnipiac poll shows Joe Biden leading former President Donald Trump by four points. And reiterated she is committed to staying in the race despite the results 
of the South Carolina primary on Saturday. At a rally in Beaufort, South Carolina, she said the time has come for Republicans to make the wisest choice. This is the time we need to make our choice. So when you leave, make sure you take a yard sign. If you live in a place that doesn't allow yard signs, put it in the back of your car. Go text, email everybody you know, and let them know that it is important that they get out and vote. I am not going anywhere. Well, I am going somewhere. After South Carolina, the next day I'm headed to Michigan. And then we're going to Super Tuesday states. We're going to be everywhere we need to be. But if you look at every general election poll, he doesn't defeat Biden in any of them. He's down by five. He's down. Another one came out today. He loses to Biden by five. On his best day, it's margin of error. I'm in every one of those same general election polls, and I defeat Biden by up to 17 points. In other matters, Prime Minister.